Well, hello, everyone. I'm Gary Hamill, and I'm here with my colleague, Michele Zanini, and welcome to the New Human Movement. Uh, we're going to have an extraordinary conversation today. We are very lucky to have with us uh, one of the most courageous, I would say, and uh, progressive uh, business leaders on the planet. Uh, uh, Paul Pullman is joining us. Uh, if you have read or cared about sustainability, uh, the UN Sustainability Development Goals, uh, the whole challenge of business becoming more socially accountable, you may well have already come across uh, Paul and his amazing uh, work. Uh, in 2009, Paul became the CEO of Unilever, one of the world's great multinationals that touches billions of people around the world with everyday brands we would all know and, and love. And uh, over his 10-year uh, 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 term at, at, at Unilever, Paul launched some amazingly bold goals to put uh, social responsibility at the very heart of everything uh, that, that Unilever did. And uh, you know, as you know, a lot of a lot of CEOs talk a good game about social responsibility, but 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 early in Paul's tenure, he made some some truly bold commitments. Really, I would say unprecedented at the time, and launched something called the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which included goals around water usage, CO two emissions, uh, being more uh, accountable to supplier networks, diversity. And the company has also had some extraordinary success on, on, on those various targets, uh, reducing its uh, uh, CO2 emissions per ton of manufacturing by 75% over the last decade, reducing its water usage by about 50%. And now, uh, in his new role, Paul is leading a new global social initiative called Imagine, which is really aimed to kind of take Unilever's experience and take it up to kind of a global systemic level. So, Paul, thanks a ton for being willing to talk to us today. Thanks, Gary. Looking forward to it. So, Paul, let's let's start with 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 your experience at Unilever, and uh, you know, maybe just take us through. What motivated you to do something that was really quite unprecedented at the time? I, I think today uh, Unilever is often seen, often ranked as the most socially, environmentally responsible company in the world uh, and has kind of maybe even outpaced some other companies that historically were very well known for being socially responsible. So what did you see happening in the world around you? And, and to be frank, how did you get the guts to do something quite this quite this bold at Unilever to kind of say here's here's seventy targets and we're going to start working on all of them. How did that emerge? Okay, let me write it down because I don't forget to answer all of it. But um, well, first of all, I would say with a little bit of modesty that we might have achieved some of these um, objectives and earned a lot of uh, recognition for that. But the reality is we still have a long way to go. If you look at the state of the world, I've always said very clearly that if Unilever would achieve all its targets and scoop up all the prices, but we still haven't dealt with the two most burning issues of climate change or inequality at a global level, then I still have a hard time looking my children in the eye. And we're currently at a very crucial crucial moment. So, Gary, if I may be honest, um, I won't take any of the credits yet, and the jury is out. We have uh, our job still cut out for us. But what was really the case is when I came into Unilever in end uh, 2008, which was sort of at the height of the financial crisis, it was the first time that a, for, uh, a CEO came in from the outside. And uh, the reason really that the board decided to do that was the company wasn't in very good shape. Uh, it had become internally focused. Despite a stock market that was booming, uh, it had not seen its uh, shareholder value increase. And frankly, it had become a victim like so many other companies to the shorter term and, uh, and shareholder primacy. So the remit was very clear when I came in is to uh, turn this company around and, and start to make it a longer term successful company again, just like it has been over most of the decades of its existence. Um, the main thing that uh, was in my mind is first and foremost uh, is to bring growth back to this company. Uh, I needed to create the right environment to grow. And one of the things you have to do is ensure uh, that something that you can relate to uh, very much so in terms of uh, not being an inside out uh, bureaucratic company, but being an agile 
and resilient outside-in company, um, starting to, again, put the customer at the heart of everything you do, um, running a longer-term multi-stakeholder model, um, investing in all of your stakeholders to get a longer-term return, also for your shareholders. So a very simple um, philosophy that I have is that um, uh, organizations in itself are there to serve the world. Business cannot succeed in societies that fail, nor can business be a bystander in a system that gives them life in the first place. And it is absolutely crucial that uh, our business models address some of these worldly problems. When they do, they find the sweet spot and do very well. When they become very internally focused and self-obsessed, they probably lose their mojo. So the first thing I did was uh, take a page out of a book of one of your colleagues um, from good to great, as, as you well know, uh, Jim Collins, where he talks about nurturing the core before you stimulate progress. Coming in from the outside, I knew that I was the one that had to gain the respect. Uh, despite my position being held in the company, I could not demand respect. You have to earn respect. So I spent a lot of time studying the history of the company, going back to the roots of Lord Lever, um, who started the company at the end of the 19th century. And at that time, he talked very much about shared prosperity. He was a very uh, extraordinary man that uh, guaranteed six-day work weeks, uh, put pension plans in place. In World War I, when the man went off to volunteer for the wars, he guaranteed that jobs back paid, continued to pay their women, built housing for their workers, and the list goes on. And he believed in, a pro in, a, in something that he called shared prosperity. He didn't build his company for the shareholders, nor frankly for himself, because he continuously invested actually ahead of the money coming in. And uh, so I looked at that and I said, why don't we go back to the origins of the company? I symbolically held our first board meetings at the house that Lord Lever had uh, built and lived in. And some people were surprised about uh, the meaning of it, but it was really, really to pass a strong message. We're going back to the core of this company. Out of that, the hey, Unilever hey, Paul, system. Paul, can I just can I just interrupt there? Sorry for this, because I I want you to continue that narrative. But I want to go back to just where you started, because it was it was kind of a very unexpected juxtaposition. You said that when you came into the company, it had a bit of a growth crisis, was going sideways. You had pressure from shareholders to do something about that. If I look at some of the other things that were going on in that industry, you know, with the 3G putting Kraft and Heinz together and running their usual playbook of, you know, taking out costs, working on the denominator, how did you go? I mean, what was the logical sequence that you took your stakeholders through as you went from, hey, we're a business that's kind of going sideways, maybe not changing fast enough, has missed some opportunities to, I need to take a long-term perspective, rebuild the company from the roots, because that's not the usual CEO playbook when you walk into that kind of a circumstance, right? You take out costs, sell off underperforming businesses, maybe you do a merger or two, do some share buybacks, but that, that was quite an odd starting point. <laughs> Given given how you described that problem. It was an odd starting point, perhaps for many, but not for me. Uh, in fact, if I would have taken the page out of the Kraft Heinz playbook, as you rightfully reserved, uh, refer to, uh, Gary, it would have been the easiest thing to do. We all know zero-based budgeting. We all know how to take costs out. But now with the benefit of hindsight, perhaps, but I would even say with the benefit of foresight, uh, it hasn't built any shareholder value. Someone very wisely said once a long time ago, you can save your way to prosperity. And I still believe that today. So I looked at the company and it actually had become victim of the short termism and started chasing the tail. If in consumer goods, you get into this downward spiral of uh, seeing your, uh, your profits go down, your top line not growing, you start cutting your R&D, you start cutting your brand, uh, spending, your investments in people, your spiral keeps going and you start cutting more and more. And this is what happened with Unilever, who saw its turnover go from the mid-50 billions to about 38 billion over the last uh, decade uh, prior to my uh, arrival. So I didn't really have a choice. I said to the board, if I come in, we need good corporate governance. I insisted that the board was half women, half men. At that time, we only had two nationalities on the board, which were the Brits and the Dutch. And they were all white men. And that's not an environment that I wanted to uh, be, uh, be uh, working in. And I said to the board, we really need to invest in the longer term growth of the business. Fortunately, I had a 
chairman, Michael Treskov, who understood that very well, who understood the fiduciary duties being as much ensuring the longer term viability of the company than satisfying the shareholder needs, but at least not chasing that shareholder return on a quarterly basis. So we thought the company needed something more energizing than shrinking and selling off businesses to try to make its numbers. It needed to start growing again and expand. But nothing better, Gary, than growing behind a meaningful business model. Growth for growth's sake or just creating value for a few other billionaires in this world is not very motivating and appealing, nor is that a long-term strategy that you can get people engaged behind. So we went back to the roots once more of the company and we said, let's introduce this Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which really has as a took as a first and foremost responsibility to take um, ownership of your total impact of your company in the world. I think that's a very important philosophy that many companies now suffer from because they're not willing to go beyond scope one and scope two. For Unilever, that meant if you're in the food business, you need to attack the issues of deforestation or uh, livelihoods for poor smallholder farmers or the food waste or the obesity on the other side. Taking responsibility of your total impact. The second thing we said was if we wanted to run this company long term successfully, we have to run it for all of the stakeholders. You cannot optimize one stakeholder, often the shareholder, at the expense of the others and expect to maximize your longer term returns. So we moved to a multi-stakeholder model where the shareholder return was a result of what we did, not an objective in itself. And these were very clear boundaries or principles to run the company successfully. Then we started to invest in the company. But the first thing we did was is launch what we call this Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. And this could not have happened, Gary, if we would not first have worked on our own employees, their purpose, the overall company purpose that we wanted to achieve, because you need that energy, that alignment, that commitment behind the plan. The plan is very simple. The plan was indeed 50 targets. I'll come back to that in a minute, which might sound overwhelming to many, but it was basically three overriding targets to decouple our growth from environmental impact because we are clearly living beyond the planetary boundaries, which is now increasingly clear to many people, to increase our social impact because inequality and exclusion is clearly a big issue. And again, it's come to the foreground since COVID even more so. And then create the necessary livelihoods. In our case, 5 million jobs for women, 5 million jobs for smallholder farmers in our value chains. Because I could see that the biggest issue coming up is before climate change probably even is, is the issue of social cohesion. We put 50 targets behind that, time-bound targets that we made public. We, audit, we had it audited, uh, in our case, by PwC and we reported on it and discussed it. And that was a very simple reason why I felt that was important. Uh, trust in society is low. We've all seen the Edelman trust barometers. The trust was not going up. And I think one of the main drivers of trust, Gary, is transparency that drives that trust that becomes the basis of, of uh, prosperity. So we said very simply, my last sentence is we said, um, this is such an audacious plan Nobody has ever done it before, but we know that it is needed in the world, that we simply can't do it alone and that we don't have all the answers. And to my surprise, that made us human and uh, encouraged the broader uh, stakeholders to work with us. And, and frankly, if they would not have been such an instrumental part of making this plan come alive, we would have never been able to achieve it. So, Paul, two questions there. And then let me let me hand it over to Michele. To maybe take us a little deeper there, but but two questions certainly occurred to me. You know, one uh, and both of them kind of revolve around purpose. Um, you know, one is that you know how how in a way how did business lose their way on this? Because you know most companies, I think most great companies that have endured for a while, they 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 had a purpose. I'm sure you know Lord Lever had a purpose when he created the company. You know, Ford wanted to bring mobility to the masses. Uh, even 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 Bill Gates, you know, wanted to make technology accessible to everybody. Wanted the PC to be available to everybody. And and but but somewhere we lost our way here. And you you talked about kind of the tail wagging the dog. And we started mistaking the scoreboard for the game, the scoreboard, you know, creating shareholder value for the game, uh, which, you know, that's not the game. That's just the residual result. 
So maybe just reflect for a moment on like how did we how do we kind of go wrong? If you go back, as you're saying, if you go back to a lot of those early business pioneers, Cadbury, uh, 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 Lever, uh, Wedgwood, uh, all of them have this broader vision of social purpose. And so maybe reflect on a moment, uh, for a moment, on just like what happened, and then I'll, I'll have a follow-up. Yeah, well, I think we lost that uh, probably in the, in the 70s, 80s, when two things happened that came together. It's first of all, the liberalization of the financial markets which allowed banks to get uh, and create far more financial instruments. And if you take that forward to today, we now have financial instruments that are about uh, 500 to 600 trillion and a global economy that's 100 trillion. And they're all chasing returns. And that is a very devastating effect. So you might argue in simple terms that we have become subservient to the financial market instead of the other way around. I've always taught, uh, been taught that the financial market is there to serve society. But I think increasingly we allowed under the Greenspans, Clinton, by the way, was, was also partly to blame for that, may I say. Um, we have uh, created uh, this, this liberal environment that frankly hasn't really served as well. And then at the same time, you had Milton Friedman coming out with the business of business is business. I'm not so sure he would write the same paper today. Uh, at that time when he wrote it, we didn't have these planetary issues. We were in a booming economy. Uh, the social issues were being taken care of to a great extent already then. And uh, he saw the role of business incredibly narrowly. And, and some people have literally interpreted that. And it took us, frankly, uh, the, the, the next uh, 30 to 40 years to realize that that wasn't a sustainable business model. Now we're in 2021. We've learned a lot. We've learned that we have a, um, an economic system that is unsustainable, a consumption pattern that is um, unsustainable, a um, model of growth that excludes too many people that is unsustainable. I've said many times that in, in any system where too many people feel that they're being excluded or that they are not getting their fair uh, opportunities will ultimately rebel against itself. And I think that is what you're starting to see. So the thing is, is coming home if you want to. And uh, we would be well advised again to bend that curve of capitalism. I've never been really too uh, keen to enter into discussions on capitalism. But what is very clear is that Franklin Roosevelt, when he did the New Deal in the US in the 30s, he bent the curve of capitalism with inclusion of social security, with the pension things, with a safety network on, on health care to a certain extent. They were all novel at that time. And you had a boom period of the economy. I'm simply arguing now that that bending of that curve is again needed. And we would be well advised to do it uh, as business community faster than probably governments can do it, especially at a moment when global governance seems to be gridlocked and many countries seem to be ruled by populists or nationalists, or may I say, xenophobists. So Paul, let me, again, so let me come back to something quite granular. So you talked about Unilever kind of, you know, finding your purpose again and, and some symbolic actions like meeting in Lord Lever's house. But, but in a company that size and that complexity, practically, how did you engage your, your colleagues in a conversation about purpose? I mean, it's one thing for you to pontificate. It's another thing, you know, to create some dialogue, some conversation where people develop this conviction and, and, and can work this out. And, you know, we all have plenty of examples of companies that have kind of some high-minded purpose at one level. But the reality is just a fundamental disconnect in, in what they do every day. So how did you how did you engage your colleagues in that that conversation? And, and how did that purpose act? You know, through what mechanisms did it take shape? Well, I wanted to come back to the previous comment you made, Gary. It is so easy to advocate purpose. I'm sure Boeing has a purpose. Uh, Wells Fargo has a purpose. GE has a purpose, but also Enron and uh, Parmalat had a purpose. And yet they were not able to bring these values underpinning that purpose together with their behavior to drive the right uh, culture, which is also one of the issues I have with, with the shared value concept. You can easily justify your businesses like a lot of the tech companies do, for example, but then fall short incredibly towards your responsibilities towards society, externalizing enormous costs that then will come on the shoulders of many others who often can ill afford it. So what we did in Unilever, like you have to be sustainable yourself to build a sustainable company. I also believe that you have to 
find your own purposes first before you build a purposeful company. Uh, a company is a collection of individuals. It's a living organism, as many people have pointed out. So before we even launch the sustainable living plan, we actually spent a year with our top team, the first 100, then the next 500, then the next 3,000 on developing our own purpose. And uh, the first uh, part was, what is your own purpose? What makes you tick? What makes you get up in the morning? The second part was, how do you use that to influence others? And the third part, not surprisingly, how do you get results with that? I enrolled uh, Bill George. Um, Bill is a longtime friend of mine. Uh, he's written the book, uh, True Norse. And with some other wonderful people, uh, we had that rolled out across the company. Now it resulted in most people understanding what we're trying to do, becoming more aware of their own purpose in life, which frankly, very few people have thought about, sadly enough, in a, in a, in a total world that we live in. And uh, that helped us collectively to develop the purpose of the company, which frankly was only one step removed from the founder. Unilever at that time, Lord Lever at that time was talking about making hygiene commonplace in Victorian Britain when one out of two babies didn't make it past year one because of the issues of, of hygiene. And we uh, translated that in today's terms by going to our purpose, making sustainable living commonplace. So it uh, nurtured the core, it stimulated the progress, it really built on what this company was founded on. It went back to the values that this company was founded on that had been diluted over time. And then it had a, a cadre, if you want to, of uh, leadership that had gone to their own purpose discovery journeys that uh, was important. The second step we did was measure our impact. Once we said we're responsible for our total impact in society, which we'd like to be positive if we want to be around for the longer term, not negative or less negative, that doesn't serve anything. We looked at the impact of all of our brands being a consumer goods company and decided where we could have the biggest impact. And that was the start of the development of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Now, the final thing I had to do was, um, since this company is run by 170,000 people at that time, um, you have to empower them and they have to own that. You cannot run it from the top. It wouldn't serve, especially when you're in such a big change management process. So we um, uh, have to do that through our brands. And it is very important that we measure and track the impact that all of our brands had. Some brands on deforestation, other brands on CO2 emissions, some brands on labor standards. And that was really the beginning of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan that guided us in where we should focus to make that impact. But more importantly, we also had to change the boundaries for people's behavior. I've learned over my life, at least, that basically you have to believe in the goodness of human beings, that everybody would like to have a positive impact, that nobody likes business to be uh, having a negative impact in the world or being less bad, but yet collectively, we're not seeming to, to get there. And one of the reasons for that is that um, the boundaries drive our behavior. So one of the boundaries I had to change was get rid of quarterly reporting, which is a ludicrous concept, uh, I believe, and, and, and many others, by the way. Uh, stop getting giving guidance and, and managing business versus expectations and forgetting about the realities of the world and moving our compensation systems and other things to the longer term. So we created the right environment for people to behave. And that was the start of our success story over the uh, the following 10 years. Did you have, so I, I just have to ask this one follow-up. When, when you started to have this conversation, you know, down through the organization about purpose, I can imagine that at the beginning, there was a little bit of cynicism and, and eye rolling of like, okay, here's the new guy. Yeah, we're gonna like go through this exercise and it'll be all touchy feely. I mean, at, at what point did people understand you were serious about this? And maybe, maybe do you remember an anecdote or something where, where you know, where some fairly hard bitten, you know, finance person or something is like finally got it and, and like connected with their own purpose? Because, you know, at the top of organizations, there are a lot of people who, have, who maybe haven't been in touch with the emotional side of their lives for a while. So uh, maybe just reflect on that for a moment. No, that is the most difficult part uh, to become human again. And I would say uh, this answer might surprise you, but even after 10 years at Unilever, I probably had 80% with us 
and certainly momentum. The company had built 300% shareholder return. We had outgrown our competitors year after year on both top and bottom line. And we had restored the business to more than its former glory in, in many aspects. Uh, working, uh, by the way, proving that this longer term multi-stakeholder model with purpose at the core was better than a myoptically focused um, shareholder primacy model. But um, I would say probably f five or six years in, uh, was when it really started to click, when we could make our stories more coherent between the results that we were showing and the actions that we were taking. Uh, there was a trust deficit also with the financial market in the first year. Uh, people were worried that uh, we were not going to deliver, that we were trying to buy ourselves time, but not performance. And that, that really uh, took some time. Uh, Stephen Covey said it well in his book, Seven Habits, if I remember, when he talked about um, you cannot talk yourself out of things you have behaved yourself into. So I was well aware of the fact that we needed to behave ourselves out of a certain um, history. And that took uh, three, four years. Then getting it into the company at all levels. A former boss of mine told me once that for every level in the organization, count one year. Now, that wasn't appealing to me. So Unilever had 12 layers or 14 layers when I came. So I moved that to five layers right away to make the organization agile again. But still, it takes time to get it into the organization. And you have to be mindful of that. And it's often not that people don't believe you or don't want to do this. It's just that they are under binds, that they might have constraints on the jobs that they are doing or different incentive systems that are imposed upon them that make them feel uncomfortable. So you need to consistently work this, explain this, communicate, uh, put capabilities in place. And that just takes time. Think about a procurement department, which is absolutely crucial for this whole transformation that for years has been focused on squeezing the last um, penny of costs out of a supplier, especially during periods when your business isn't going well, by the way. And all of a sudden has to focus on sustainable sourcing, on longer term relationships with suppliers, leveraging their infinitely bigger R&D capabilities to drive innovation into your company. That's a whole different skill set. Uh, in the countries itself, we had general managers running the countries that basically had come from the finance functions because they were very good in restructuring and closing factories. We had to change 70 of the top 100 people to get this growth and mentality back. So it took probably four or five years before that really got into the company at a level that I could feel comfortable that... Um, that we were achieving things. The most important one in this, perhaps, is when it got into our brands, when we could really show that the brands that were more purpose-driven, a brand like Domestos, a toilet bowl cleaner, making a commitment to build 100 million toilets to fight the, open, uh, the issues of open defecation, a brand like Lifebuoy for handwashing, making a commitment to reach a billion people in handwashing and help a child reach the age of five, when 4 million children die every year of infectious diseases like pneumonia or diarrhea, a brand like Dove putting women's self-esteem in the center. Only when we could show that the purpose at the core of these brands was not only making these brands more profitable, but also grow faster, did I think the light went on in the majority of the people. And then don't forget millennials are there, Gary. They are purpose-driven and... Uh, you know, we became the most desired employer. We had 2 million people applying to us every year, the third highest after Google and Apple, which was our surprise. But I can tell you, 75% of the people that came in came in because of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. And they're pushing. Paul, you, I wanted to uh, uh, dig in on the organizational changes you, you made to accompany, you know, that individual change, you know, the, the purpose statements and the like, so that, so that you know, this, this new way of, of, of working would really stick, right? And, and one thing that you mentioned very briefly, but it just, uh, my ears perked up when you said this, is that you made this shift from uh, immediately when you, early on in your tenure at least, from 12 layers to five layers. So, which is like pretty remarkable uh, shift in, in, so can you uh, unpack that a little bit? Like how, how did you come to that conclusion and how, how did you bring it about? And, and what, what was the empathy in the, or in the organization? Did, did people leave because they were just no longer 
you know, required in some areas or did people find other jobs? How, how did you how did you make that uh, make that happen? Well, it's in a lot of areas you need to work at the same time. This is not just one thing and that's the magic bullet. You need to work your purpose. You need to work your overall strategy. You work to your organizational structure, your compensation system, your culture. And if you don't work all of those at the same time continuously, I don't think you get there. So um, for us, it was important to make the organization uh, very uh, agile, uh, innovative, I called it uh, managing agility and resilience at the same time, which is a dichotomy that many people struggle with. And one of the things you have to do is is uh, shorten the chain of command if you want to become an outside-in company, uh, delegate decision-making to the level of where the knowledge is, and that's constant and hard work. So one of the ways to achieve that is to take friction points out of the organization. In any matrix structure, when there is an intersection between the global and the local organization or between one function and the other, uh, many companies struggle to keep that positive energy. And it is that negative energy that starts to drain you and drive you down. And, and Gary and you call that bureaucracy. So the less intersections you have, the more clarity you have on decision rights, the more you can drive decision making down, especially in consumer goods, by the way which is made up of a lot of changes and decisions on a daily basis, the better you are as an organization. So getting rid of layers is being seen as very healthy in an organization. Uh, I tell you, most people would welcome that. Increasing a span of control, most people would welcome, uh, bar the few exceptions, but those are not the ones you want to keep in an organization. Um, so I think the, the takeoff of these things is... is um, is fairly positive. And that, that went together with an organizational design structure that made it a little bit more uh, clear uh, and, and simplified on how we would run the company between the global business units and the local organizations. Wow. And, and how long did that process of defining the new kind of organizational model, how, how, how long did that take? And, and did, was it just you and a few people that were sketching this out, or or did you involve a broader group of people in figuring out the you know the new organization? Well, I'm deliberately um, laughing, Miguel, because it isn't finished. The whole yeah. thing is mm -hmm. um, the whole thing is we we invented something every other year to keep people on their toes, and we were continuously evolving the organization as the world around us evolved. Mm -hmm. Sometimes being ahead, most of the time, fortunately, being ahead. Sometimes being slightly behind. But um, and, and when I left, again, there was a whole new wave of change based on the, uh, the digitization of society, if you, if you want to, that required, uh, again, a different model. And I think coming out of COVID now, we have, again, a different challenge. So if you don't keep your organization on the toes, and this is, in fact, the challenge, because many would have a change fatigue. They would say, ah, oh, we've changed so many things already. Uh, why should we continue to change? So keeping that mentality of feeling comfortable with change, embracing and, uh, change, um, uh, keeping that level of uh, curiosity in your people, for example, is a, um, is a very important um, uh, prerequisite for a successful organization. The moment you think you've achieved something or the moment you think you're succeeding, most likely, at least in fast-moving consumer goods, you're already losing. So I like that. And, and, you know, some people in the organization struggle with that. I understand that. But broadly, I think people embrace it if you can link it to the success of an organization. When it doesn't result in success, then it becomes very frustrating. Yeah. Well, I think it drives me crazy. And I think it drives Gary crazy as well. That there's this widely held assumption that you do a reorg every three to five years, right? And that's basically how you change. And and you know that's not the logic you you apply to product innovation or any kind of other innovation. You you constantly try to improve, right, and 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 evolve. And but somehow we're just kind of prisoners of this mindset. I mean, one company that is very similar, one CEO that has kind of said very very much that what you said, Paul, is is Jean Romain of Hire. We've been studying Hire for over a decade, and every six months there's something new going on. And so every time we write about the company, there's like it's it's out of date because anyway. So I wish more more CEOs 
were like you. Can I? I wanted to show you. Well, if I can build yeah, on that for uh, let me build on that for one second yeah. with two sentences. Yeah. Because I've always avoided the reorganization in Unilever, and during the ten years, you have not seen a reorganization. If you go back to the the press or anything that we said in in uh, publicly, um, but um, it is so difficult for uh, CEOs to make the harder right decisions versus the easier wrong. And when you have a reorganization, it frankly is the the result of a lack of courage to take the right decisions when you need to take them. So you, you don't close plans. You don't get rid of people when you need it. You don't manage your people on a continuous basis based on performance. You don't have the tough uh, discussions, so you don't make the tough decisions. That is doing more damage, and it creeps up on you. Because the CEOs broadly have learned that you can play the game for five, six, seven years, actually link it to your incentive systems and, and shareholder value and, uh, and get away with it and then disappear. With the average tenure of a CEO less than five years, the game has become easier to play. Then the next one has a big restructuring, a big write-off, gets away with it. Surprisingly, the stock market reacts positively and the game starts over again. And that's just a lack of leadership. If you ask me what we're missing in this world, I always say we're missing trees and we're missing leaders. We are just not creating the right leaders to run these companies. And this is also, by the way, one of the reasons that the length of a publicly traded company in in your country, the US, for example, has dropped from about 67 years when, when I was born to less than 17 years today. We simply don't know how to run it anymore. Yeah. Well, let me then build on something you, you just you just said, Paul which is like, we don't know how to build the right leaders. Why, why do you think that is? What, is? what is the root cause of that? Well, there are many different reasons, but, um, and I, I alluded to some before. I think the first one is the MBA program is Milton Friedman on steroids. Uh, also the incentive systems and the rankings. If you can go to the banks or to the consulting companies or the Goldman Sachs of this world, you get five bonus points. But, um, you know, we're, 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 uh, we're creating a system where people are trained to maximize the return on financial capital. It's getting a little better now, but very few have really truly integrated in their programs the need to also optimize social and environmental capital. Very few have integrated the broader social sciences. We're all teaching in silos. And frankly, the, uh, the, 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 the people teaching it have not very well evolved they're thinking either over the years, a 10-year system, frankly, is not very construct, uh, very conducive to the faster changes that we need in education. Then the second thing is we've let norms creep into society, as I mentioned before, that drive some behaviors. There is a, a notion, I believe wrongly so, and, uh, and many have written about that as well, that the duty for the, the board is uh, to protect the shareholders. It's not true at all at least in not most of the jurisdictions that I've seen, but that shareholder primacy has crept in from the board. 75% of the CEOs, right or wrongfully so, believe that the short-term pressure actually comes from their boards, not even from their investor community. So it drives behavior in the wrong direction. And then, you know, if, if that is the case, and these are the results you're getting. Well, wow. okay. Yeah, so it's multi-pronged and, you know, the business school <laughs> maybe and the curriculum Needs a, needs a deep rethink. Um, before I hand it back over to Gary, I, I, I wanted to show you one slide about individual purpose that comes from a McKinsey survey. You might have seen this, Paul, already. Yeah, let's see if I can share it um, uh, real quick. So McKinsey polled a lot of people working, of thousands of workers in the United States around whether or not they are uh, able to live out their purpose at work, right? And 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 here are the results uh, by 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 rank, right? So executives and senior managers almost unanimously are saying yes, we're able to do that. Eighty-five percent of those polls say, you know, we we can do this. We strongly agree with the statement: we can live out our purpose at work. The number of people who are not like in the senior cadres, you know, like frontline people and first-line supervisors, you know, only fifteen percent agree with that statement. Right, which is pretty shocking to me when I when I first saw it. And you might say, well, but maybe you know people that are uh, you know more junior or uh, you know further down in the organization. Horrible expression, but you know, but you know what I mean. Further down in the organization, you might say, well, they actually per, per, work for them is not 
you know, a really important part of their identity. So even though they're not living out their purpose at work, they may be living out their purpose elsewhere. But McKinsey also asked them the question, like, how important is work <laughs> to your life's purpose? And, you know, two thirds of them said very important. So we have this like hierarchical mismatch, it seems, if you believe this data um, between, uh, between, you know, uh, you know, rank and the ability to, to live out their purpose. So I wanted to get your, your take on this. First of all, does this like, I mean, obviously, I would imagine that at Unilever, you wouldn't see this discrepancy, but but take this discrepancy as generally representative uh, of a corporate America. Uh, wh what do you make of it? Well, it needs a few uh, peelings of the onion to get to the real reasons, because otherwise it's too um, easy to jump to quick uh, conclusions. Indeed, if you look globally, the uh, average engagement score of all companies uh, uh, across the world people will say I'm 15% engaged, which I find the saddest statistic that I've come across in my life, that we spend all that time working and 85% and doesn't get any meaning. The issues of mental health and well-being is, is going through the roof because people feel they have one set of values in one part of their life, their private lives, and a different set of values when they get to work. And that causes the necessary stress and anxiety. This is really not how I think you can get the best out of your employees. Unilever had an engagement score in the, the mid of the third tercile, actually, when I joined, and we ended up in the top of the top tercile. Uh, but that was throughout the organization, an 85 90% engagement score. Frankly, we wouldn't have wanted to settle for less. Now, here is how I interpret your statistics, if I may, uh, without having all the facts either, so I have to be careful. 85% of the managers think I feel very purposeful to be at work. But if you ask all the employees, they only think that about 15% of the managers are really living a purposeful life and running the company with a true sense of purpose. There's a lot of um, uh, woke washing out there uh, that is happening and, and we see it daily around us. If, if that purpose would be so high, the behavior actually of the leadership would be quite different, if I may, on a macro level the good companies aside, and you've mentioned some of them. Now we go to the bottom of the organization. It is actually that uh, people might say 15% of them can live their purpose, but it is probably the case that 85% of them actually want that. What we saw in Unilever is that most of the ideas to make our Unilever li uh, sustainable living plan come alive was actually coming from the uh, lower levels in the organization, if you want to, that were the drivers of uh, purpose, that were the drivers of, of uh, pushing management uh, sometimes into the uncomfortable zone. Because we also know that if we truly want to drive the change, we have to make commitments that we might not know all the answers for. Too, too, unfortunately, too many leaders in the companies play not to lose versus playing to win. Only commit to things that they know 100% they can agree, even or that they can achieve even if they know that it is not sufficient for society. So true leadership is getting to that level of discomfort, but also um, being able to, uh, to deal with that gap of, of discomfort simply because you know it's needed in society and simply because you know that if you don't reach for these ultimate objectives, you'll always end up in a worse place than you otherwise would. And that was the case in Unilever. We didn't achieve all of our objectives by far. And some people were cynical. Are you getting fired? Are you losing your job? Um, are you um, calling the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan a failure? No. It took us 100 years to have 10% sustainable sourcing. When I left, we had 80% sustainable sourcing. Admittedly, we failed for the 20%, which needed much broader and, and deeper transformations, including governments. You know, we said we would um, reach five mil create 5 million jobs for smallholder farmers. We only created a little bit more than 3 million jobs. Yes, we failed 2 million people, but we are in a much better position than where we were before. We said we would reach a billion people with hand washing. We actually reached a billion too, uh, as a coincidence. Uh, we'd only reached 50 million in the previous 100 years. So setting these ob audacious objectives might make you feel uncomfortable, but I think it unlocks something in people and the organizations that always makes you end up in a better place than you otherwise would have been. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank Hire for underwriting the costs of producing this interview. 
Hire is the world's leading appliance company and also a global leader in the Internet of Things. For the last decade, Hire has been leading a remarkable revolution in management. It has proven that even the largest, most complex organizations in the world can be entrepreneurial at their core. Now, back to our conversation. So, Paul, thank you. I, super interesting, by the way. Thank you for all of this. I mean, deeply accords with, I think, how, how we've tried to think about these challenges. Let, let me come back to a couple of things you, that, 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 that you touched on. You know, there's, there's a very common trope in executive suites, and I get this all the time when I talk to CEOs, that essentially the reason they can't do what, 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 what you did at Unilever is, is because of short-term investor pressure. And, uh, you know, uh, my answer to that is like, well, where does courage come into this? Because it's your job to carry, as a CEO, as a board, to carry the investors with you, to paint that picture of why we're doing this, of being able to demonstrate the progress, the milestones, so people have some confidence you're actually making progress. Um, and of course, you know, when, when, when you look at any stock exchange, whether it's, you know, London, New York, wherever you look, what you'll find is companies with a whole range of PE ratios. So you'll see a company like Tesla, I don't know what their PE is, but it's something astronomical. You'll find other companies where the PE ratio is eight to one, six to one, 10 to one. But, but it's hard, at least we, we believe, it's very hard to argue that like investors are implacably short term. If, if it was, no company would have a big PE, right? And so let me, let me just get you to respond to that because here you are a new CEO under a lot of pressure and, and you also said something, let me just bring this in. You said that it was probably five to six years before you felt this was really in the DNA, that in a sense it was irreversible. So what I'm thinking here is, all right, you're embarking on something that took quite a while before it really felt like it was sticking. I'm assuming the results came faster. You weren't waiting for five years to show you were making progress, but yet it took a lot of perseverance and yet the, 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 the reflex, I think, of, of a lot of CEOs is just to say, I mean, literally, if you challenge them to do anything truly difficult, truly systemic, truly new, the first, can I say, excuse is that, like, we don't have the time. It's like, am I, am I being unduly harsh or, or, <laughs> or maybe a little bit fair in saying that sometimes it's not the investors, it's just a lack of courage, a lack of foresight and the guts to commit? Oh, I don't disagree. As I mentioned before, that we have a leadership gap at political level, but also at the private sector level. And it would be naive to deny that. And um, you, you see it in many things. Uh, big statements are made that they will not put money in politics anymore. And uh, six months later, those same companies are again supporting the people that were advocating, basically undermining democracy in your country. So what signal do we send? Um, you know, the uh, compensation of, of CEOs in the U.S. has gone up during uh, COVID, uh, it turns out now, when most of the people have suffered probably more than they've ever done in their lives during the crisis. And these are not the people that have anything to do with it or are the cause of it. So the leadership behavior is closely watched. And, and frankly, with a few exceptions that we need to celebrate and encourage, we have nothing to be proud of. Even today, we only have 20% of the companies in the world that have made meaningful commitments to keep our global warming below one and a half degrees. The other 80% hasn't done it yet. When we know, when we know what these enormous costs are that we are incurring and that we put the future of humanity at risk. So yes, it, it is courageous leadership and courageous comes from the French word cur. That is actually the heart. It starts with the heart. We have to humanize leadership again, the empathy, the compassion, the ability to listen to others and include, uh, uh, make it inclusive, a purpose-driven, a multi-generational thinking, the broader partnerships that so many shy away from to attack these issues that are undoubtedly tough. Otherwise, someone would have done it before us. So it does require a new level of leadership. And that's why that is such an important part of what we need to invest in and why I admire what you both are doing, because you're in the business of educating people. And, and that's a gift that uh, I don't take lightly. And that's a ultimate sign of leadership that you have, which is, which is really by putting yourself to the service of others, knowing that by doing so, you're better off yourself as well. And that principle is not just a religious principle that's always proven to be right, at least in my life and in the situations I found myself in. So for example, if you have to move your company to the longer term, it is hard work. Um, 
uh, governance needs to be changed. You know, you have to work with your board and change your board if needed to get them to support that philosophy. You have to look at your incentives. 78% of the incentive structure in the US is short term. There's very few companies that have moved to a longer term incentive. So it, it discourages that longer term behavior. So look at incentives, look at engagements. You know, the dialogue with the financial market is not very good. It's actually a short term dialogue for many. I deliberately made a decision when I came into Unilever that I would talk to the right shareholders who would support our strategy. I also made it very clear that if you didn't like what we were doing, you should put your money somewhere else. If we start dancing to the tune of all these shareholders, frankly, we become schizophrenic. It's only five years in or six years in that I could see a basic shift in our shareholder base, higher loyalty, significantly higher holdings. And when we got the attacks from the Kraft Heinz or others that undoubtedly everybody has dealt with an activist or whatever, we had a solid base of these multiple stakeholders that were providing a buffer around the company to protect it. You need to make your strategies longer term and communicate that. You need to have your longer term metrics. Our compensation plan, for example, were five-year compensation plans with a significant upside if it was going well, but it was related 100% to investing in company shares and having the company do well. There was no free lunch in Unilever. So changing all of this and going back to realism and, and um, putting your word where your mouse is, is hard work. It is not easy to do. And there are forces that are trying to derail you. There are cynics and skeptics along the way. That's why it's so important to have a purpose as well, because that purpose keeps you on, on, on track. It keeps that true north, as Bill calls it, in uh, ahead of you. Uh, otherwise, it's so easy, again, once more, to take the, the easy way out and, and sometimes actually to your own financial benefit, sadly enough. I could have earned significantly more in Unilever, and I'm not complaining. In fact, I was the only CEO who said he got paid too much, despite not keeping, and despite not increasing my salaries for 10 years. But but I could have easily manipulated the numbers, be a hero in the newspapers, earn more money, but do the wrong thing for the company. I just don't want to be part of that. Yeah, and you you talked about this dynamic, which you see very very, I think, over and over again is. There's, I, I called it years ago, uh, Paul, I called it denominator management, right? There's, there are easy ways of taking down capital, taking out headcount, doing all these things, making it look good for a while. And then a new CEO comes in, takes the big restructuring charges, you know, resets the, the, the baseline so it's kind of easy to get over that hurdle, then looks quite good. And then it just like, and you just watch this every four or five years, you go through this cycle. I, I want to come back though to something you said and unpack this a little bit more because it's certainly at the heart of the passion that Michaela and I have uh, and the difference we're trying to make. You know, you talked about once you had this purpose, so many of the ideas of how you how you met those very challenging sustainability goals came from people on the front lines. And I and I want to tell you just a little story, uh, Paul, if I can. You know, years ago, and, and I might have told this before on one of our podcasts, so if I have to the listeners, I apologize. You know, many years ago, back in the early 1990s, we built one of the first uh, kind of open innovation markets at, 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 at Shell. And um, we asked people all over the world in Shell, what, what ideas do you have for, for what we should be doing? And one of the things that was shocking, this was 93, 94, I suppose, is a third of the ideas that came from the front lines across Shell were for renewable energy. That was way before anybody was talking about this, but they could sense it. They knew it. They understood what was coming. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, we, we have this view that we're up against all these immensely challenging problems. We need to unleash every gram, every ounce of human ingenuity we have. And yet in organizations, you know, so many employees still really don't have that chance to contribute. And I want to show, you know, Michaela shared a little data. Let's see if I can share this. This is from a big uh, uh, European uh, study, Eurofound, uh, 31,000 enterprises in Europe. And I just, I just want to share this data with you for a moment. So, so this, this is the percentage of EU-based companies where first 80% or more employees have some freedom to organize their own work lives, only 12%, where they're actually encouraged to step up, find new problems, innovate, only one out of five have some financial upside, like all the executives have, fewer than one and a quarter, uh, are, are in jobs where they have the chance to learn and get retrained and improve their skill set, about one in eight, and, and where managers actually believe that those people on the front lines can make a real difference, right? About one and a quarter. And so, you know, we, we have this sense that 
that that in so many organizations there's still this kind of uh, bureaucratic privilege, if you like, and we're building more diverse workforces uh, and more inclusive workforces, but not necessarily one where people at the front lines have a lot more voice. So. Maybe talk for a moment beyond kind of flattening the organization at, at, at Unilever, taking out layers. What did you do to really open up the channels and let people know your voice matters? We're going to invest in your ideas. Kind of how did you unlock that, that latent uh, creativity that was, that was there, uh, you know, wait, wait, waiting for permission to speak up? Well, again, it's, uh, it's many things. The first thing we did actually was make everybody a shareholder and move the whole organization to the same compensation system and uh, different levels, obviously, for experience and the levels in the company. But it was a transparent system for everybody and, uh, and uh, an opportunity to get the company shares and ownership. We also spent uh, a lot of time on, on driving agility in the organization, uh, which meant, uh, for example, I introduced 30-day uh, plans when we had an issue in consumer goods find a solution in 30 days. That required people to work together, usually at country level, to do that. So you empower them. Um, we moved to our IT systems to real time. It used to take us six or seven weeks to close the books. We moved that to seven or eight days. First of all, it helped me not to continuously mull over the same numbers and, and focus on building the business, but it moved our information system to real time. And that was transparent for everybody. So you could see who was doing well on working capital or who was not doing so well on working capital. You could see what's part of the organization were moving forward faster on diversity and which were not. And if you get a real-time information system that is the same for everybody, people stop discussing the data and start focusing on action. And, uh, and by the way, making that transparent uh, makes that uh, an, an accountability to everybody. We put the same... Um, meritocracy systems in place in terms of um, uh, performance reviews and assessments and ratings and rankings are very transparent, which I thought was needed uh, to get credibility behind the diversity efforts. That's really what I thought was the bigger benefit, but it did much more and came to some of, of, of uh, uh, answers to the question that you're just raising. So uh, different things, mechanisms we put in place. And then it's communication. I've always communicated to the whole organization. My blog was for everybody. My uh, monthly uh, podcast or, or um, webinars were for everybody. Uh, I used to go around 70% of my time and, and talk to anybody in the organization. And uh, the first thing I would always do visiting a country is visit someone's home and, uh, and see how the housewife basically uh, was using our products or what her needs were and visiting a store. Besides it, I didn't need to see any charts in the business uh, to tell me how well it was doing. It also sent a clear signal on what counted. Uh, we completely moved the perception of being in sales and being a, you know, a secondhand citizen because the innovations weren't coming anyway. And this was the person being beaten up, beaten up by the retailers into that's the prime force of driving our business. You, you, we forced everybody into sales training to get a respect for what these people were doing and to make the organization uh, at least produce uh, things that the salespeople would be successful in selling. So that type of thing. Um, the, the real jobs that create value are actually the jobs, what you might call lower in the organization. I would call them higher in the organization in the pyramid that I have in, in my mind. And that's a, probably a different pyramid than most people are looking at. Yeah, no, it's, you know, it, it, it's exactly no. It's it, we, you know, we use that term as a shorthand so people that understand we're talking about full, the people at the edge of the organization. But we totally share your your you know organizations don't have a bottom, right? <laughs> There's no top bottom. It's it's uh it, you know that in a way that the metaphor kind of makes you a prisoner of that old mindset, which is which is not very well. The, the most the most the most important people are always the people who are closest to the yeah. customer. Yeah, no, that's no. where the battle yeah. is won or lost, right there. And yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I know we're short of time. A couple. Yeah, sorry, Paul. You're going to add something there. No, I would argue I have a soft spot for the people in the factory. My father worked his whole life in a factory, and um, they often are not. Um, the ones that um, uh, 
uh, make the management decisions and the biggest strategic directions, but they pay the price for the inability of us or the incapability of us to make the, the right decisions. And their, li- their jobs are on the line, exactly. uh, always the first ones. They're being seen as a cost item versus an investment. Usually these people know what's going on. They have a lot of common sense. Uh, I'd strongly encourage everybody to listen to them as well. So yeah, customer facing, but also where uh, you truly create your products inside of the company would be good to listen to some of yeah. those people as well. Yeah. At least I learned an awful lot from them. Yeah. Well, and the best thing actually is to get the production people to be customer facing, which you know, and we have a couple of companies in, in our book where they've done exactly that. And, and that you, know, you have an additional late level of magic that happens because you know, they can take directly the insights from the customer and do something uh, uh, mad, you know, uh, truly innovative in, in the products they make. Um, so, Paul, I know we're running out of time, but if, we, if you're patient with us, we'll ask you a couple more questions. Is that all right? Yeah, yes, no problem. Okay. So let me, let me ask you my last question because what you've taken us through in the last few minutes as you were talking about all the different changes you made to, um, at Unilever is – given us confidence that there's a lot we can do like inside the organization there's a lot a ceo can do and the leadership team and and the broader uh, group of people working at the company right to to make to move the needle but but i think you you would agree that that's in a way necessary but not sufficient right because organizations you alluded to this earlier organizations you know are part of a broader ecosystem and their their pressures that constrain their individual impact. And so we gotta think about the system more broadly, right? And and you know you're um, have this in, in, on your uh, on the side of your new effort. Imagine uh, in which we'll link to. You have this uh, really great chart and explanation of your you know, theory of change, right? That starts with the courageous leader, but then kind of expands to you know thinking about the collective. You know, courageous collectives, you know, of leaders, and then more broadly mobilizing the system. So, I know it's like it's a topic that deserves a whole conversation in its own right. But if you could maybe speak to that for us a little bit and, and share your thinking about what it takes to mobilize an entire system, you know, beyond the individual organization. Yeah, the the reason I created Imagine after my um, my moving on from uh, Unilever. Um, is really that we are not moving fast enough on the most burning issues like climate change and inequality. CEOs are increasingly held to a higher standard, yet can only do so much themselves. Uh, uh, For a CEO to solve the issues of plastics in the oceans or to decarbonize a whole value chain when the energy grid or other things depend on governments or, or, uh, or other partners is very difficult to do. Often when one CEO has an initiative, the key competitor doesn't want to participate. There might be an issue of time or an issue of uh, knowledge. And also on the political side, when you need to drive these broader changes for each company to uh, knock on a politician's door, um, often using the word lobbying to some extent, is outright confusing. Uh, that's why you don't see labeling schemes. So that's why you don't see progress in many of the things that, that, uh, that uh, we know are needed. So what we have done is, uh, create a neutral platform that is different than uh, trade associations, etc. What uh, I found with trade associations and many of the consultancies, um, they the, the the trade associations often will will try to move the 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 floor up, but it's the lowest common denominator. And uh, as I said, we don't have the time, so we need to be more aggressive. So our theory of change is very simple. If you put per industry sector about 20 to 25% of the CEOs together across the value chain, you can actually drive uh, tipping points. The key thing is here CEOs, because it's about, as we talked, human transformation, as well as systems transformation. If you have these CEOs together, they actively become, they actually collectively become more courageous. The key word also is value chain, because there are many issues that can be solved if there is a higher level of trust and cooperation in the value chain so that investments will be made here, but the benefits will be shared across. And then finally, um, the critical mass of 20 to 25 percent. If you have 20 to 25 percent of a responsible part of the industry, which is now possible for most industries together, then you get civil society who wants to join because they have a critical mass to deal with. And that becomes a constructive relationship. You have governments that start to listen. 
and you have a higher probability of de-risking the political process and moving issues forward. Very concretely, we look at the industries that have the biggest impact on the sustainable development goals. The energy transition is the broad one that is so managed in so many different areas, so we stay away from that. But we focus on fashion, we focus on food, we focus on uh, tourist and travel, we focus on the finance industry. In fashion, we now have about 70 companies together across the value chain, collectively getting rid of single-use plastics that requires totally different standards in the industry, collectively internalizing biodiversity challenges and moving to regenerative cotton. No company could have done that alone. And collectively moving the industry to the Paris Agreement of uh, one and a half degrees uh, maximum, which is net zero by 2050 in terms of global warming. To the point now that the collective works together even to buy green energy at critical mass and unlocks the market faster than otherwise would have happened. These are things that would not have happened uh, in the old structure. We don't pretend to have all the answers, but we certainly see an acceleration. On food, we have 30 of the biggest food companies across the value chain. One of the major things you need is fertilizer. It's a highly uh, carbon using, carbon emitting uh, production process. Now we can make green um, fertilizer using hydrogen, but it costs the farmer 10 times more. The farmer can never pay for it. They will never buy it. So the system is blocked. But if you know that it is only one cent on the end product and the Unilevers, the Nestle's or the Danones have made commitments to be net zero, including on scope three, which is absolutely important and where most of the emissions are, then you can work with trust across the value chain to solve that dilemma. Very simple things. We're now moving the whole agriculture industry to regenerative farming. Again, you need a common standard. How do you create that? Critical mass of leaders setting it, inviting the civil society to get the credibility and the knowledge, get the governments involved, and off you move. Franz Timmermans, who is the number two in Brussels, in Brussels for the European Union, is working on the European Green Deal, the farm to fork package, the biodiversity package. And he says, this is the best thing you've done to me because for the first time I can talk to the whole industry around labeling and come in with one scheme that I realize is perhaps a compromise for everybody, but it is better than what the old system was we were operating in. That's what Imagine is doing. And that's what we try to do more, create these courageous collectives and drive these tipping points. Yeah, Paul, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, what, what I'm struck by is that you have brought system thinking to everything you've done. So when you came into Unilever and you realized we have to reorient the company, it needs to become a growth company, it needs to become uh, socially accountable, you understood that wasn't a single initiative. That was incentives, that was targets, that was transparency, that was personal transformation, and you dealt with that as a system thing. Now thinking about that you know, at, at the next level and realizing all the industry players have to come together, the regulators have to have a seat at the table and so on, and I think, you know, let me just connect that. I think that's one of the things that is not taught in business schools. We do not talk about systemic change. And, and, and you know, I think people believe that, you know, the only place systemic change can happen is in Davos or at the UN, but it doesn't. It happens with, you know, individual CEOs or, or others who have the courage to bring people together, to raise issues, to put the data on the table. And, and what's, very, what's very encouraging from what, what you just said is, you know, you talked about getting people in, in, in a room and, and what I hear you saying is that that just like kind of selfishness can be kind of contagious, you know, you're in it for you, I'm in it for me, whatever. But I think you're also saying the kind of moral courage can also be contagious once you you understand that. And I I, I think that's enormously positive uh, and, and, and hopeful. I, I want to end with one question. It's kind of a big one. And so take it take as much of it as you want to bite off. But you know, we, we spent a, a bunch of time on climate and sustainability, but the other big issue, and I know you have a passion for this as well, is kind of the state of capitalism. And um, you know, let me, again, let me, let me share just a little bit of data quickly there. You, you, you talked about CEO pay that, you know, you, you probably could have taken more off the table than you did, uh, but you, you know, d didn't. Um, and certainly I think that's one thing that a lot of people, you know, has gotten a lot of attention. And, uh, you know, it's kind of easy to talk about purpose. It's another thing to say, 
you know, can you really say people are our most important resource when you have these 300 to one uh, differentials around pay? Let, let me throw up a little bit of other data. This is this is data, you know, this is from the US. Um, over the last, uh, you know, 30 years or so, you see corporate profits as a share of GDP going up, wages as a share of GDP uh, going down. Uh, you know, during during the financial or during COVID the last 16 months, uh, U.S. billionaires have seen their 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 uh, their uh, 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 economic value go up by 1.1.9 trillion dollars. Uh, now we're glad in the United States we have a few billionaires that comes from creating a lot of new companies, but nevertheless, uh, so that's kind of you know worrying. Uh, if you see uh, uh, then. Um, uh, growth and productivity, obviously, it's been slowing across the OECD, but, you know, most of the productivity gains that companies are making are, are not going to uh, frontline employees. And then when you ask people around the world, you know, do you think these big institutions have their best interests at heart? You know, a vast majority say no. A vast majority say they're working, you know, for the advantage of the few. And so, you know, whether whether it's the Trump voter uh, who, you know, uh, says, you know, wanted Trump to, quote, drain the swamp, or whether it's all those young people who lined up behind Bernie Sanders and said, let's give socialism another chance. It's, it's not like this is a right or left problem. It's not. It's, it's people on both sides, young, old, both sides of the political spectrum saying, it doesn't seem like the system works for us anymore. And so I don't know if you if you if you if you felt that if that's something that is part of what you're working on and imagine, but just give us your top kind of level perspective on that and and what might be a, a few of the leverage points for rebuilding that trust. Yeah. So um, while the data is overwhelming, I think they don't lie. And even in the financial crisis, which was 10, 12 years ago, all the money went to bailing out the banks, and nothing really went to the people that paid the price for it and are still paying the price for it in the enormous levels of government debt and and other things. And uh, people clearly felt that uh, banks were too big to fail, but people were too small to matter. And if you have those statistics, it is not surprising that you see an increasingly more and more populist coming to government that uh, play on these uh, levels of dissatisfaction, but don't really have the solutions. And Frankly, you've had your fair share of that in the U.S. over the last four years. So this is a serious problem. As I said before, any system where too many people feel they are excluded from or are not fully participating will not be a sustainable system. It ultimately will rebel against itself. So we need to move to a system that doesn't just reward capital. Our economic systems were designed at a time when capital was scarce and, and resources were abundant. Now resources are scarce and capital is abundant. So that we need to adjust our economic systems. First of all, putting a price on these scarce resources, hence the integration of social or environmental accounting, if you want to. And secondly, um, uh, rewarding uh, uh, labor and, and, uh, and tilting the system away from rewarding capital. Uh, the, the, the tax laws will have to change. All the tax laws, uh, as you've seen in the U.S. recently again, on how much tax the billionaires pay. Um, and you might think it's a great system to have billionaires, but I've never understood that. Um, from how many plates can you eat, how many cars can you drive? It is more of a sign of market concentration and, and lack of competitive forces and, and distribution of wealth is, is a bad thing. I, I'm not so proud of being a billionaire in money terms. I'd rather be a billionaire in reaching a billion people and improving their lives. So the return systems have to change. Our tax systems have to change. Our social safety nets have to change. And COVID has brought that to life. Uh, COVID uh, has reminded us that we still have four and a half billion people in this world on less than $5 a day, that we have 1.6 billion workers without safety nets, that 150 million people have moved back into absolute poverty, that 800 million people still go to bed hungry, not even knowing if they wake up the next day, that 240 million children have still not even been in school in their lives. If we don't create, and, and yet we understand now that we're in this together, that we cannot solve these things if we don't collectively solve it from all perspectives, be it climate change, be it the pandemic, but be it also living in harmony between ourselves as fellow citizens in this world. We first and foremost belong to 
tribe humanity. So I would argue that any organization needs to ensure that it's also working on the social cohesion in its business plans. This means that if you are a company moving from uh, fossil fuel energy to green energy, you have to be sure that there is a just transition. Governments need to support that. Safety nets need to be put in place. If you're a company that employs people and you know that the evolution is fast with with the changes that happen in this world, the, the, the fourth industrial revolution and others, you need to continuously invest in educating and re-educating your workforce so that they have the capabilities to look at other opportunities. The bigger issue that we're going to have is social cohesion. We've lost the equivalent of 500 million jobs during this pandemic alone. And frankly, we didn't start from a good uh, base point, as I mentioned before. Youth is disproportionately affected by this, especially women once more, who bear the disproportionate brunt of, of our failings. If we don't find a more inclusive way of growth, then we're going to have a serious issue of social cohesion before any of the other issues we've talked about. And there are some signs that that is coming up already. So the good thing about it is that we know now, with all the data that we have gathered, that building back greener, investing in, in um, restoring our biodiversity, in greening our buildings, electrifying our mobility systems, etc., not only create a more robust and um, resilient environment of the future, but it also creates more jobs, better jobs, and more resilient jobs exactly for these people that desperately need it. You know, Paul, I think I appreciate what, what you've said in a very, 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 very deep way, because the lesson I take away from this more than anything else, you know, and let's come back kind of full circle. Where we started was you were really talking about courage and the courage in Unilever to take a long-term view, to take a systemic view, to take a, a broad social view. And certainly what McKaylee and I have argued, if, if you go back through human history and you look at the points where we, we accomplished amazing things together, whether that was moving beyond aristocracy and inventing self-government or, yeah. or, or beginning to push back against slavery or beginning to, to, to push back against patriarchy, uh, and, and today we would talk about, you know, moving on climate and, 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 and moving on, on, on workplace uh, opportunity and justice. If you look back on all of those things, our argument would be it never started with you uh, with a utilitarian argument. It didn't start with like somehow this will create more wealth or it's better for the economy or will make more productive companies. It always started with with like a moral argument saying like this is the right thing to do, you know, for human beings. And. And what I've gotten from you today is, is a lot of a, 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 a good sense of, of, of moral courage and, and with it a, a certain kind of indignation that shines through, which I think is, is, is also right. So here's my, here's my final question. When you're talking to other CEOs, you're talking to leaders, how do you, how do you attempt to infuse them with that kind of moral courage? Because I hear a lot of people who kind of have the language and they might say, yes, we have this great initiative on uh, diversity or inclusion, but you dig any deeper and you know, it's like a defensive posture. It's because, you know, somebody's you know, shamed them into doing it. It's not that they're proactive. They can't tell you the next five things they're going to do. How do you, how do you help infuse others with that kind of sense of purpose and moral courage? What has been your strategy for being being a positive virus in that sense. Yeah. Well, I will give you two answers very quickly, Gary, because you're setting me up to some extent nicely. The first one I think is, is to really link it to um, um, economic performance. We just don't have the luxury of time to let the moral, which will always win longer term, to met the, let the moral factors uh, 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 drive the behavior. It simply won't work in the time that we have. But increasingly we can show that a more diverse organization is better performing, that an organization that decarbonizes um, uh, and is less uh, carbon dependent uh, is better performing, that an organization that works human rights in its value chain or has a better relationship with its uh, communities is better performing. Just Capital just compared the Russell uh, 1000 companies in the US and found that companies that were run on, under a longer term multi-stakeholder uh, uh, values with purpose at its core were over the last four years outperforming their peer group by about 30%. So increasingly, 
the facts are there and we would be wise to listen to that. And the reason that this is increasingly possible is two things or three things if you might want to. The first one is we are at the point that the cost of not acting is higher than the cost of acting. So that's an attractive proposition to be in if you want to earn some money and also good for your shareholders to indeed be more environmentally and socially concerned. The second thing is that technology has developed at such a space that um, that uh, many more things are now within reach and there's a lack effect between awareness and what is possible. And the third thing is that we have a whole new wave coming in of young people that are purpose driven and that demand these changes because after all, it's their future. Now, my second part of the answer, totally unrelated to this is, how do you reach these leaders? And indeed in the position that I'm now in, which is not, I've moved from bought authority or formal authority to moral authority, the best thing I can do is probably put my thoughts down. And we're issuing a book in October, which is called Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. And it's about creating a movement. It's a social enterprise, again, I created. It's a movement that describes how successful companies profit, not from creating the world's problems, but from actually solving them. And for business to be successful long-term, I believe they need to show that they have a net positive impact, not be less bad. I call it moving from CSR, corporate social responsibility, if you want to, to RSC, responsible social corporations. And increasingly corporations that understand that they will have to compete on trust and on, on that trust being built by these stronger relationships with these multiple stakeholders. So what is a net positive company? A net positive company takes responsibility of all impacts and the consequences that it has in the world, intended or not. It's operating for the long-term benefit of business and society. It creates a positive return, as we talked, for all stakeholders, where shareholder return is a result of what you do. But it is also an organization that partners for these broader system changes to drive these transformative changes that we talked about beyond the little self-interest of the company alone. And it's only if you come at those levels of, of operating that society will keep you around. The companies that do will be successful long term. The companies that don't will soon meet them at the graveyard of dinosaurs. So read the book, just like I obviously uh, highly encourage your book of uh, humanocracy. Uh, read the book Net Positive when it comes out. And it has some useful tips, both in the um, human transformation that is needed. We actually start with that. And then the system transformation that you can lead your company through. Paul, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for a very practical and also a very inspiring message and one that's filled with with hope. Uh, we, we share that optimism uh, most of all because I think there's a new generation coming that's going to hold us all to account on this. And uh, yeah. uh, so th thank, thank you so much. It's been just an enormous pleasure. Gary and Miguel, you were wonderful. I enjoyed it and I hope we can do it again one day. Above all, Thanks. be safe.